Hi everybody, it's Anne with Art on the Creek. Thanks for joining me today. You know, we are in my home studio in Parker, Colorado, but I might be dreaming of sitting on the beach and having my toes in the water and, oh, what, what's that? Come on, that's it. You're gonna need a bigger boat, right? You're gonna need a bigger boat. Oh, that's all. Okay, we need a bigger boat. Well, I think there's plenty of room here in my studio and you're all welcome. I'm really happy that you're here. Let's go paint a shark. Are you ready? <laughs> here we go. You know, I'm kind of a little bit all over the place today, so thanks for indulging me the very, very corny intro, but um, there's so many uh, one-liners from Jaws, and the movie came out in 1975. It's a Spielberg movie. I'll talk more about that in just a minute, but I want to talk to you first, since we are on our beginner watercolor lessons. Look at the cute tape I found. Okay, I'm going to open this up so that you guys can see it, because it's Sheba washi tape. I mean, I'm, I'm in heaven. I'm just going to say that right now. One of the most fun things about having a Sheba when we did have Sasha in our lives was all of the Sheba merchandise. They are the dog of Japan, just like I think Labrador is probably the most popular dog here in America. Maybe the Golden Retriever runs a close second, but um, yeah, there's Sheba everything everywhere. And I found this Sheba washi tape and I couldn't resist you guys. So this little section here is just me taping up my Paul Rubens cold press watercolor paper. It's just a five by seven. I've got a list to, of all of the supplies that I'm recommending for this round of 15 beginner lessons down in the description. But let me show you this tape. Is that adorable or what? It's got all the Shebas on it. There's a red. That's the one we had, little Sasha. There she is giving a howl. You know, Shebas are so vocal and they do like to give you a pack howl when you come home. And they're just the cutest, most funny dogs that are full of personality. And my little Leo, I am so happy that you're here in my life now and uh, wouldn't change a thing there. But boy, Sasha sure was a big imprint on our hearts. So I've got Sheba washi tape this time. You don't have to tape it off, but I think that might be kind of fun for this particular one because since we've got our bigger boat and the sharks are looming in the water, um, I kind of thought it would be really fun to paint this. Now I'm gonna fast forward through this part because my drawing was a struggle, I'm not gonna lie. I kind of kept getting it uh, too short and I had his nose too round. I was making him cute. I couldn't, I couldn't help but make this shark adorable, which is an option if you wanted to make a shark, but I kind of wanted to make him look a little bit more menacing. And I don't know, I would say that he's about uh, a scale, <laughs> on a scale of one to 10, he's probably about a six on the level of menacing, but I still wouldn't want to run into him. So let me zip ahead to the end of the drawing here and I will provide to you a, uh, a PDF line drawing that you can trace. And there will also be a link to our reference photo in the description. Here's our shark. What I really like about this the most for a beginner watercolor lesson is not so much the shark, but the way that the sun is coming through the ocean and all of those little light reflections there. It's just such a fun thing to be able to paint. Um, you can use this technique we're gonna learn today if you're painting sun coming through the mist, shining down on a landscape, or in this case, through the ocean. Uh, so this is a really easy, easy technique to do and I'm excited to share it with you guys today. So let's go over the supplies real quickly. I'm recommending this time around the Paul Rubens watercolors. Uh, last time in our last set of 15, I recommended the uh, Winsor Newton Cotman set. Still a wonderful option. In fact, anything you have on hand is your best option. You will of course need some paint brushes and I really like this Princeton Neptune Snap set. Pencil, kneaded eraser, and the paper that we're using is the Paul Rubens 100% cotton paper block. And it's five by seven, a real manageable size. Um, I do have my Sheba washi tape, but you can just use any kind of tape that's a low tack. Anything from the hardware store that's the painter's tape, or you can certainly use uh, any kind of washi tape that you like. Now I do have a full supply list in the description below and you know don't feel like you have to go out and buy anything at all and full disclosure all of those links below are affiliate links and if you do choose to shop that way I will thank you in advance because I do get a small commission from your purchase there. Uh, 
The only other thing you're going to need today is a rag. Uh, you can see there to the right, I've got a piece of an old t-shirt that I've cut up, um, or you can just use paper towels. Well, we're also going to use paper towels too, so uh, maybe paper towel would be your better bet today. The color I'm going in with first on that wet on wet, that's the technique we're using now, is Prussian blue. I'm still using my stroke brush because I want to cover a big area. Now when you get your paper wet, you're just looking for that even sheen. You don't want any puddles, you don't want any, uh, any water running, just enough to make it glossy and just kind of get it activated, if you will. And then I've got a little bit of burnt sienna left over my palette, so I'm just kind of mixing that Prussian blue with whatever is there. You can just kind of experiment, maybe add a little bit of yellow, maybe add some burnt sienna, just to try and experiment and see what other shades of that Prussian blue you can get. You don't want to add much, just a tiny, tiny bit. So that's why I like to leave my palette messy, <laughs> because oftentimes I will start a new painting and add whatever I've already got the remnants of the previous painting on my palette. I will kind of add that in. So now when we did the drawing, the only line that I gave you, you'll notice on the, the PDF line drawing, is a little rim, kind of a curvature at the top as to where those light beams are going to start coming in. And here you'll be able to see how we're going to deal with those. I'm just leaving the color the darkest on the bottom, right and left, and now what we're going to do is take a paper towel and kind of twist it so that you have a length. And pull it out so that you've got like a, a, I don't know, two or three inches or so, and then twist that and gently tap in a random curved way so that you can lift off that pigment. This paper is so forgiving and it's so good at that. What you wanna do is just kind of make ripples and it doesn't have to be anything great because we are gonna go over this and do another level of lifting. So the the, biggest thing you want to look for is to be able to lift it while it's still damp. And now I've got it crimped in a much tighter little ball. And I'm just kind of crimping, or excuse me, uh, lifting out, just dabbing out the, uh, the white space on the bottom. Now I'm going to get my brush wet. And just with a wet brush, I'm going to make little sideways swiping motions in like a little ray beam. Uh, down the length from the sunbeam where the surface of the water is all the way down to the edge of the paper. Now you'll notice that in some places I'm going right over the shark. That is absolutely okay because you're going to paint, paint it again. If you end up getting a lot of blue on your shark, maybe you want to dab that out. But uh, for the most part, this is so pale, it's not going to make a difference. You can just blot it right out if you do get it where you don't want it. So you'll notice that I'm using that brush, either turning it vertically with the line, so I've got a more narrow line, or on the left there, I've got a real wide swath. And I'm just kind of playing, just kind of getting these beams in here the way I want. And now because watercolor has a big color shift, this might seem a little counterintuitive, but what I want to do, that first pass of uh, lifting off the, the sunbeams, was kind of a test to see if I had the ocean dark enough, and I feel that I didn't. So I'm gonna go ahead and put in another wash of the, the blue, and rather than try and go around all those uh, areas that I've just lifted out, you can see I just decided to paint right over it. That's so simple, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Just paint right over everything that you've got, and then you can go back in with a damp brush and lift everything out again. And that way, some of this might show through, which is really kind of cool, because that will add a little bit of depth to your scene. So we're just going in continually, going around, just making it just a little bit darker. Because uh, like I said, the color shift when watercolor dries, it can come out just really too pale. So it's kind of one of those things that you'll have to finesse and get used to. As you gain more miles on your water brush, uh, excuse me, on your watercolor and uh, on, your, on your brush and your pad, as you gain more mileage, that's what I'm trying to say, as you have more experience, <laughs> you will learn about how dark to make something, um, depending upon the, the strength of your wash. Now the wash is liquefied watercolor. And what's going on over there on the left on my palette is a rather thin wash. It's about the texture of 2% uh, milk. I like to talk about the thicknesses in, uh, in dairy <laughs> terms. So you'll hear me say, for instance, um, it's about as thick as yogurt or it's about as thick as heavy cream or about as thick as either skim milk or 2% you know, milk, whole milk, whatever. Those, those types of ways I think are easy to describe how thick, how, what is the viscosity of your watercolor? And, and 
it is completely something that you'll have to finesse and figure out what you want in your painting because not everything is going to work for every single artist. It, it depends on how much water is on your brush. Uh, it can even depend what kind of paper you're using, how, how much is going to be absorbed by that paper. And that will become very apparent uh, if you get a cauliflower bloom. And you'll see as we go on, I do end up with a little bit of a cauliflower bloom on the shark's tail, right at the portion where the tail hits his body. But we can go ahead and correct that too when the time comes. Sometimes you can really use what cauliflower blooms and back runs, things where you just have your water kind of out of balance. You can use that to your advantage. But for today, we're going to try and keep this as smooth as possible. So I've just finished that second glaze and now I'm going back in with that same kind of stretched out vertically twisted like a length, a twisted length of paper towel and I'm just tapping in. Remember to keep it curved. You might want to change the twist every now and then just so that you can generate a new pattern. Keep it slightly curved and try and lift out more in the center than you do on the edges because when you look at that reference photo the light beam is strongest in the center. Now we'll go in and put in the shadows of that uh, light coming through in just a minute, but you'll see the technique here of lifting off. I get my brush wet and then I pull it through where I want the pigment to be removed. Now you can do this when the pigment is still wet and I'm going to just pull that through and then I'll wipe my brush off. So you can see why using a big stroke brush like this is so great for this technique because you can get these wonderful beams of light that come through and gradually get wider at the bottom. It's very subtle. I really like the very wide uh, beam of light to the left and then the subtle beams of light uh, coming in, you know, uh, on the sides of that. And you can just put in however many you want. I would just say don't overdo it. Don't do too many, but do as many as you think would look good on your painting. I kind of kept mine toward the outer edges because the shark would be casting a shadow. Now that you can see the light on the bottom of the ocean there, or I think he, he might be in a tank that seems awfully shallow, but you know, sharks do come to the shore, don't they? Oh gosh, I did see Jaws. It did scare me. <laughs> um, We'll talk about that movie a little bit too while I'm drawing this here. So the movie came out in 1975. And like I said, Steven Spielberg, one of my absolute favorite movies. And I read the book first. So I was 11 years old when that came out. And um, the book, <laughs> I'll never forget that summer because I, I was laying on my bed reading and I woke up and I just picked up the book and I started reading and I realized that I had read so long that I missed lunch. It was summer vacation and my dad was a, a school principal. So we all ate lunch together and I missed lunch because I was reading so much. So when I came downstairs, then I just felt so good to see my family because I was starting to get a little bit scared. And then I went back up and finished the book after lunch. And I think I read the whole thing in one day and I read until the sun went down to finish that book. It was just, it was totally gripping, really fascinating. And I just still love this movie so much. It's a good book, a great movie. And uh, I hope if you've seen it, you've enjoyed it as well. So what I'm doing here on my palette now is I, the first puddle, I was mixing the Prussian green with burnt sienna and then a little bit of burnt umber because I wanted to show you why it's so important to have uh, ultramarine and burnt sienna on your palette. Do you see this wonderful gray I can get on the top? That is achieved with burnt sienna and ultramarine. And both of those pigments too are granulating pigments. So you'll notice on that palette, you will see those two colors separate just a little bit. And the reason for that separation is that the pigments, the ultramarine and the burnt sienna have different weights. So they are going to settle at different places in your puddle. <laughs> uh, and on paper, that really does uh, separate and turn out quite nicely. It's called a kind of a granulation effect. So this would be, if you were to mix some of this and just keep it in your own paint pan, it would be your own multi-pigment uh, version of a gray. Here we are, I'm starting with the tail. I've switched over to a number six round brush. You have a few brushes in this set that I'm recommending. You have a number four, a number six, and uh, the stroke brush. If you decide that neither of these round brushes are uh, narrow enough for you, you can certainly invest in an additional brush that would give you a uh, finer detail. But for what we're doing today, I'm going to try and keep all of these lessons compatible with this brush set. It will also be a very good way for those of you who are brand new to painting to learn a little bit of brush control because you do have to be a little bit more steady with a larger brush 
when you're doing a little bit of detail you can get it done but it will really give you the opportunity to learn how to finesse that brush without going to a small brush now I'm doing a little bit of wet and wet on the shark itself because most of the pigment would be toward the downside the underside of the shark so I decided I kind of wanted to let that pigment creep upward on a wet surface on its own just to kind of give the shark a little bit of a gradient now when it's done just to glance at it it really does look kind of like it's all the same but when you get up and look really close you'll see that his nose is just a little bit lighter and the back end of him is a little bit darker so i was able to achieve some of that and i have to keep looking over at the picture because i either didn't have it bright enough on my monitor or for some reason i, I couldn't get it large enough to see but I was really struggling to to see the details on this shark so if I miss something I am terribly sorry I uh, I did the best I could <laughs> with my limited old lady vision that I struggle with um, but I think that it turned out just fine so now we're going to go ahead and outline these uh, the, the fins here that he swims with it like you know what would be his little arms I'm not a biologist I do not know the parts of sharks. I know that they have fins and I know that they swim and I know that they're fun to paint and that is fine for me. So if you are one to know the names of these fins, fabulous, that is wonderful. Please mention them in the comments because I'm sure that there are other people out there who would like to know. I'm not one of those people, so I'm just gonna go ahead and say, these are the little fins that he has coming out the side and they're probably not little, they're probably very big. In fact, I don't even know what kind of shark this is. Um, if anybody knows what kind of shark this is in the picture, that would be really cool to know, actually. I would love to know that. So now I'm gonna go in with that paper towel and along the edges here, I'm just kind of taking out a little bit of extra pigment that has run in where I didn't want it. Now you'll notice where the shark has on this fins, on the, on the rim of his fins, it is darker, but then it's kind of variegated. It, it's, it's not an even, even line where it comes in there. So I'm just kind of trying to get that unevenness of the, the border of that line around his fin, I'm trying to get that situated in there. And to do that, I uh, distributed it with water and then I was able to tap out the excess with a paper towel. So now I'm just going to kind of play with the tail here and this is kind of where I uh, had an accidental cauliflower bloom I think but uh, we'll go ahead and fix that and that won't be a problem at all. And now let's go in and get uh, the little bits around the edges to looking just right. We're just putting in different layers of gray and I think what we should do is probably give this a dry and then we'll come back and go in and see where we stand because this gray will also have a color shift just like all other watercolors. Now that we've got this dry, let's go ahead and move over to our number four brush. And I'm gonna mix a rather large pile of this uh, Burnt Sienna and Ultramarine. Um, I'm going to keep it a little bit thicker. I'm gonna keep it a little bit more viscous because what I want to be able to do is to have this a little bit darker. This is going to be where I'm going to go in and add the details to our shark. So you can see here, I'm just kind of playing with the levels of blue and brown just to kind of get it exactly the type of gray that I want. I want it very similar to what we've had, but maybe a touch more blue, maybe a little bit cooler. So you can be the judge there and you can play with that on your own. You can see here is um, where I'm going in and trying to fix the shape and shadows on the tail. And then I'll elongate that fin there because I really didn't like the way that that looked. So this is your other opportunity to go in and just make whatever changes and corrections that you need to make. And just remember that you're using a darker pigment. So this will, if you do need to lift it, this will be a little bit more challenging to lift. Although neither one of these pigments are a staining pigment. So you probably will be able to do it just fine as long as you catch it soon enough. Here we go around this fin again, and you'll see that this will give us a very fi a fine and detailed outline look. Now that's not necessarily what we want. We'll, um, I'll get back to that in one second. We want to go ahead and add the gills in and then we'll go around this fin as well. And right now I know it kind of looks a little bit outlined, but don't worry about it. This is the part that we will fix later. It is not finished yet. All paintings go through a little bit of a wonky phase and this one is no exception. So we're going to put in his mouth and make sure we have that curve just right. 
You can also paint him with his mouth a little bit more open if you want to. You have a lot of options here. You don't have to paint him exactly the way that I did. I'm just putting kind of a little C shape behind his eye to create a little shadow. And now I'm going to go in with a wet brush there and just kind of blend out all of this uh, darker pigment that I just applied. It's still damp. It's still wet. So we can really still move it around. And that's what I really like. That's a lot of fun to do with watercolor is to put that pigment down and then kind of manipulate it on the paper. So I'm just trying to get all his little fins in here. He's got his tail back here and this is where I kind of changed the shape of the tail. And now uh, we'll go in and just make sure all of these fins are, uh, are painted just the way I want. And now I'm going to go in with just a little bit of that Prussian blue because I noticed I did miss a spot there. So I will show you how to fill that in. And of course it's going to be way too dark. So what I'm going to do is get my brush wet and kind of flick it upward in a parallel motion to that uh, beam of light that's coming down. And then I'll just go in and blot off the excess that's kind of above the fin, go back with a wet brush and just kind of flick and blend that so that it can create more shadows in the beam. And that way you'll never notice that there was a correction right there. A lot of little tips and tricks that you can do like that that are really kind of fun. And I think honestly, I think you just discover those just by painting and just by playing in the paint. Um, that's the best thing you can do. If you are sitting down at your studio one day or wherever it is you paint and you just really don't know what to paint, just play with the paint. Just see what it does. Try and lift it off. Try and move it around. Try and do some things with it. And you'll come up with a lot of solutions that you can use later. So let's zoom in here really closely because I'm gonna, I've am gonna i got that number four now and I want to show you with some of this darker paint, it's more viscous, how I'm doing the eye. I'm just kind of tapping it around and I'm making sure that I leave a little bit of white space because sharks eyes are a little bit kind of glazed over. They just look kind of vacant and I did want to make him have kind of a dead yet alive look, me or should I say deadly, <laughs> alive and deadly look. Um, so I just wanted to leave a very little bit of white space. So really I just kind of did very slight tapping motions there. And now I've got a very light a thin version of that gray and I'm just kind of filling in little shadows here and there. I'm not being real specific, just kind of in general bringing some water into this area just so we can have kind of a modeled reflection uh, shadow look at, on the underbelly of this shark because you know how when you're um, swimming in the ocean and you uh, or in a pool and you have goggles on so you can see underwater or your snorkel mask and you look at your hands or something and sometimes it it's not quite all one solid color. It has that uh, that little mottled look to it. That's kind of what I wanted to go for on the belly of our shark. And that is the way that that's done is just by using some uh, very thin wash and just kind of freehanding it and then uh, blotting it off if you need to to create some pattern in there. And that'll give your painting a little bit more dimension and texture. This painting would be a lot of fun to do on a bigger area, but I wanted to keep this small and simple for you guys. So we're just doing it on this five by seven. So let's get this dry. And if you don't have a heat tool, just go ahead and walk away from your painting from well and let it dry naturally. For this next step, you want to make sure everything is really, really dry. And I'm going into the clean side of my water dish there and using a very little amount of water on my brush and extremely light pressure. And I'm just getting that upper area wet because now I'm going to add some shadows into that uh, water that the reflections of the water that's coming through the beams of the sun. So I've got wet on wet and I'm just holding my brush sideways here and I'm just tapping in a very thin wash of that gray mix that we used for the shark. Put a little bit of it at the bottom, not too much. And just focusing it up there on that part where the curve is that the sunbeam comes down from. And now so you don't want a solid line there, but I did want that pigment there. So now I'm going in and kind of skipping and lifting every bit here and there uh, and trying to lift that off so that it's extremely subtle. You don't want anything like concentric circles. You just want it to be very, very sheer and very subtle. So whenever uh, you're working with any kind of shadow or clouds, or uh, in this case, water coming, sunbeams coming through water, subtle is best. Use a very thin wash. If you need to go over it again, you sure can. 
here we are, we are done. So now we can take off the washi tape or if you uh, have a different kind of tape, this is when you remove that. And I always recommend, no matter what kind of tape you use, use a heat tool and hold it just ahead of where you're pulling and always pull that tape off at a 90 degree angle to your painting so that you can preserve it and not tear anything. And there you go, we are done. Uh-oh, we've got a little stain. There's something that we can do with our bleed proof white. This is also in your supply list and it's certainly not imperative that you do this. In fact, if you were to frame this and uh, put it up in your office or something, a frame would probably cover that little uh, blob of paint that, that soaked through. But the bleed proof white will cover it just a little bit more and it's never the same shade of white as your uh, watercolor paper, but it's certainly enough so that it's not glaring at you. Um, you can also try and lift it off first if you wanted to just get a wet paintbrush. Sometimes it doesn't work, but um, yeah, today I think the bleed proof white was a good solution for that. And then we can go ahead and give it another really good dry, make sure it's thoroughly dry. And I think our shark turned out okay. Let's go ahead and give it a signature and then we'll be able to say we are done with yet another fun watercolor lesson. No matter where you are in your watercolor journey, if you've been following along with these beginner watercolor lessons, I will put a playlist up in the description, by the way. I hope that you're seeing some changes, some improvement in your art and learning a few new things about yourself that maybe you didn't know. Thank you so much for hanging out with me, guys. I really appreciate everything you do and uh, have a great day. We'll see you next time. Stay out of the water. <laughs> Bye now.